Hi, I'm Randall. You might know me as... Randy. Randy, where are you? Randy. Randy. Yeah. Hang out with Captain Q long enough, and you'll end up buying a boat. So join me as I navigate the ups and downs of owning an old sailboat. So the boat is at the dock now, and it's still two plus hours away from where I live, and it's super frustrating to not be able to shoot over and get work done. So I'm really motivated to cast off and head towards home. In order to do that, I'm trying to cover all of my safety basics before we take off. So far, I fixed and tested the main bilge pump, and that's working great. I bought a Dyer Dow dinghy and rigged it up on the davits. I even got a chance to install a drain plug, so if I ever leave it on the davits, it won't fill up with water. I went through the myriad of through hulls and made sure I had bung plugs on all of them uh, and made sure the Seacocks were all operational. I fixed a slow leaking raw water strainer, which was just replacing the O-ring. I bought an e which is an emergency position indicating radio beacon, which if you get into trouble, you fire that up and it's a satellite based system and it'll send a signal to authorities or anyone in the area, which is great. I also sign up for CTO, which is kind of like AAA for boats. Beyond that, I tested the emergency rudder and then I've been running the engine and generator for at least an hour every time I go visit. I know that if I'm gonna do a 10 to 24 hour passage, I wanna keep my engine really happy. And since I don't know when the oil was last serviced, I figured it would be a good idea to change the oil and filters for the engine. And since I'm at it, I might as well do it for the generator at the same time. The first step with the oil change is to get the existing oil out. And this is a little tricky on a boat compared to a car. On a car, you can pull out the drain plug and then you catch the oil in a bucket and gravity does the work. On a boat, you just can't get to the drain plug. You can see even here, just to reach the dipstick shaft nut is quite a stretch for me. And getting access to the sump area in this boat means taking the dipstick out and then undoing a nut that allows you to get a, a thicker tube down into the sump area. And then you have to pump it out. It's best to do this after getting the engine temperature up a little bit so the oil viscosity is easier to pump. So I ran the engine for about 10 minutes and then dug around to find the dipstick nut and then I got a socket wrench to take it out. You can see it's hard to see, it's hard to get to. Um, it's, even, <laughs> it's hard even to get a camera on it. Once you can get to it, the nut comes out pretty easily. It, the trickiest part is just getting to it. You can see here what that looks like. Then I inserted a plastic tube down into the sump. I started draining this into a small pail and then I realized that seven or eight quarts of oil was gonna be a lot more than my little bucket could handle. So I went to the store and grabbed a nice big used oil container. You might notice here that I actually pulled off a sample that I'm gonna send out to a lab to have analyzed. Pumping and pumping and pumping and here's how I felt after uh, doing that pumping session. Okay, that was a pretty long day. I am like drenched, but I got it done. Pumped and pumped and pumped and pumped and it seemed like uh this semester's great. So make sure oh, I ran out. Like, Damn it. Oh my God, I think I pumped for like an hour and a half uh, in this really weird sitting position. Uh, all in all, I think I got out about six and a half, seven quarts. The engine takes eight total. That's the best I could do. Um, I did read later that some people use a copper tube to insert in that. So maybe that's something in the future, I'll get a three eighths inch OD copper tube. That way, you know, it's when it really hits bottom. Once I got the oil out of the sump, the next step was to take the oil filter off and replace that. That was pretty easy because the oil filter is actually on a remote hose although it's not ideal lying in the bilge, uh, just kind of free floating. So I'd like to come up with a mount system for that. And then once I got that back in place, now it's time to put in the fresh oil, except the oil that I'm using for this vintage Ford Lehman is actually a little bit more hard to find. Um, it's an SAE 30 as opposed to kind of like a regular motor oil. So I had to hunt around town a little bit to find the right oil and also get it eight quarts of it so that I had enough for my engine. So anyway, all this is pretty good learning. I mean, I had not changed an oil uh, for any vehicle in about 15 or 20 years.
When I was reading through the manual, I noticed there was an injector pump that they suggested replacing the oil on every 200 hours. And so assuming that that hadn't been done for a while, I figured, well, now's a good time to do that as well. It's a pretty simple process of loosening the drain plug, draining it out. There's a convenient oil level plug which you remove. That hole will weep oil once you've topped off this little sump. So uh, it's a really simple and elegant way to understand how full that sump is. And once you've got both of those plugs back in, you are good to go. My body is really tired. It's physically demanding to be doing this for anywhere between, you know, four and eight hours. It's probably gonna take me a lot less next time around. You're pulling a, a lot of oil through a really tiny opening. So that's just pump and pump and pump and pump. And so maybe at some point in the future, I'll get something motorized. You are so cheap. Uh, so it's a little bit less uh, time consuming. So yeah. Uh, that was my engine love day. Next up was my trusty generator. So this one was much simpler. I mean, it was way, way easier. The trickiest part of this whole thing was that I didn't have the right size oil filter wrench. So I ended up wrapping a bunch of electrical tape around the filter itself to build up the diameter. And then I just used my other wrench. So little bit of MacGyver action on that one. There's a drain hose that you can pop free and then hold the base of it below the bottom of the generator. So gravity does all the draining work for you. There's no pumping out. The generator itself only takes about three quarts of regular motor oil, which is like a 10W30. Um, so it was a pretty simple process and one I didn't even mind doing at night. I just drained out the existing oil, popped in a new filter that I picked up at the auto parts store, put a little bead of oil around the gasket, and then loaded it up with new fresh oil. Pretty straightforward. I think the total time was maybe 45 minutes, uh, and most of that was just waiting for the oil to drain. long passage like this I really want to make sure that the fuel getting to the engine is as clean as possible so I figured there's no better time than to change out the Raycor fuel filter. The first step is to empty out the dieselettes in the Raycor by cracking the valve on the bottom and then cracking the top. I picked up a couple of 10 micron fuel filters at the marine store. I figured 10 was good. They had a 20 and 30 but I figured tighter filter is probably better for me, even if I have to change it out more frequently. The process was pretty painless. I actually didn't record it, but I actually took the glass and scrubbed out all the sludgy stuff that was in that. So I had a pretty clean glass dome and then a brand new filter. The one trick with this is that once you have drained out the diesel out of this, you're gonna to wanna to refill the Raycor and top it off so that you minimize the amount of air that you're introducing into the system. So I had to go to the store and get a little jug, uh, fill it with a couple of gallons of diesel, and then fill it up by hand. Check this out, the diesel fuel settled after about 30 minutes, and you can see there's about a half an inch of nice pure uh, diesel at the top, and the rest of it's kind of sludgy sediment um, beneath that. So pretty shocking to think about uh, how much work that poor little Raycor is doing. bilge under the engine. I figured it was the burp tank, uh, which is an overflow tank that must have dumped out when we ran aground because we were healed over at like 30 degrees. So at the very least, I wanted to top off the antifreeze and clean up the mess that that made. And when I went looking under the engine, I noticed someone had put some absorbent cloth down there, uh, which were now soaked with antifreeze. So I wanted to clean those up and make that whole area tidy. I think that should have been actually a little bit of a clue that maybe there was something more significant and wrong with the system and it wasn't just a one-time thing because someone was putting absorbent pads down there but it didn't quite click with me until later on. We also have a hurricane that's scheduled to be coming in about three days so I'm particularly motivated to get the boat really happy with all the drive systems and in really good shape in case I have to take out of here. But I've been warned that the marina uh, might have to evacuate us depending upon the direction of the hurricane. The marina might be right in the um, path of the hurricane and 
they said that these uh, floats, these concrete floats are good, but only from a certain direction. So um, I've got to be ready to jump on a moment's notice, which is a little bit dramatic, <laughs> but um, yeah, we're having fun. I'm having fun and playing music. I definitely had a few moments of panic about trying to evade the hurricane and play some of the scenarios in my head. Is this boat ready to handle it? Am I ready to handle it? Do I have the necessary anchors? What kind of cove can I hide in? Thankfully, the hurricane diverted it back out to sea, so uh, we didn't have to evacuate after all, but there was definitely about a day or so where I was like, oh, this could get dicey. So probably the best thing about being at the marina was getting a knock on my hull one afternoon when I was deep into the bilge project. It was my neighbor who was a few slips down on a beautiful Hans Christian 44 pilot house. His name was Moses and he came by just to say hi and to offer a margarita at the end of my workday. So, so I went over uh, and got to meet him and chat with him about boats and meet his girlfriend, Owen, who are just awesome people. And one neat thing about Moses is that he owns one of the most highly rated breakfast and brunch restaurants in Portland, Maine. It goes by the name of Hot Supper, which is a little bit of a Maine accent for those of you not from New England. The food is amazing. Moses is a great guy and a fellow sailor. So if you're in the Portland area, you definitely want to stop by and grab a meal and say hi to Moses. So after a few margaritas on Moses' boat, he agreed to join Captain Q and myself to take the first leg of our journey south down towards Boston. I decided to break the trip into two legs. Um, I didn't want to do an overnight, not feeling totally confident with the boat. Uh, and I also wanted to keep it kind of close to shore just in case something awful might happen. The hurricane had passed and it was now time to make the trek south. We figured we'd have a nice early 7 a.m. departure. So here we go. It's go time. So I'm taking off today, and I have the pleasure of having um, my good friend, Captain Q, give me a hand, and another great new friend, Moses. Um, thank you, Moses and Owen, for treating me so nicely at the marina and uh, lifting my spirits at the end of these long days. We're gonna take off for Boston, Boston bound, and we've got the course plotted, so. Uh, well, I got like five hours of sleep last night, but it's fine, I'm pretty excited to get out there. Uh, we got a light breeze this morning, that's gonna give us a little bit of extra speed, but we'll probably end up motoring a good chunk of the way. So yeah, it's pretty exciting to kind of get everything all tidy, ready to roll, safe, and uh, take it out for our first real stretch of the leg. Should be fun. Probably 45 minutes into our trip south, and we were greeted with a display of fun by some smaller minke whales. This is just one of the best reasons to be out there sailing on the water, is to have these types of encounters with whales and nature. And to have it so quickly after pulling out of the harbor is just, it's pretty awe-inspiring. The GoPro makes it super wide angle, but we figured they were minke whales because they had such a small dorsal fin and Moses had seen a few earlier in the seasons. I'd actually never heard of minke whales, even though I grew up uh, on the coast of Maine. That was a fun thing for me to learn. So the rest of the trip was pretty uneventful. Um, we, of course, had some obligatory Gulf of Maine fog. And for those of you that don't know, the fog can be pretty thick and come on very, very quickly in the Gulf of Maine area. So that's why radar always comes in handy. Once the fog burned off, there really wasn't much wind to be had. You could see the glassy water not really much going on. Because I was so focused on keeping the engine happy, I would go down below about every 45 minutes and I used an infrared temperature sensor to read the temperature of the engine. My gauges for it don't currently work, so that was my best method to keep an eye on the engine temp um, and just kind of listen to it to see if it sounded like it was happy. Uh, and it was, it was pretty quiet. I would say, and the temperature was in a really nice range, even maybe a little bit low. We flew the jib for a few of the hours just to help out a little bit, but largely it was a motoring trip. Overall, the trip took us about 12 hours and I think it was about 88 miles. We pulled into Manchester by the sea, which is a beautiful and very protected harbor. I had booked uh, a slip at the town dock and I knew I was gonna keep it there for a few days. 
while I organized the next leg. And pulling into the dock was a pretty fun experience. Um, the boat handles really easily. The <laughs> handling and sailing the boat is the easy part. Uh, the rest of the ownership stuff is the tricky part. After we were tied up at the dock, we all went out for a really nice dinner and then uh, did our shuttle routines to get back to our respective homes. I went back to Boston and started prepping for the next leg of the journey, which will be what the next episode covers is uh, our next journey, which has a little bit more of uh, some interesting sailing. Thanks again to Moses and Captain Q for keeping me company on this leg and helping out. And as always, thanks very much to our Patreon supporters. Without your support, a lot of this production wouldn't be possible. So, so thanks very much. Really appreciate it.